Hi, everybody, and welcome to Metaphysical Insights. I'm William Becker, and I'm thrilled today to have as my guest, Tim Robbie. Tim has, oh, he's done a lot of work with archaeology, with writing, um, teaching, all kinds of things. Tim, welcome. I'd like, you can summarize what you've done better than I can in a few words. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um... So basically, I, I'm a lifelong archaeologist. I, I, I'm retired now, and I've been an archaeologist since I was about 20. Um, I've been a teacher for eight or, eight or nine years of teaching archaeology. Um, and I, for my sins, when I got older, I wound up not doing archaeology anymore, but working uh, at Stonehenge and Stonehenge in, in Wiltshire. Uh, which is, well, everybody in the world knows where Stonehenge is and what it is, sort of, or at least they think they do. Right. Um, and yeah, at the same time, everybody knows that it's one of the world's great mysteries and nobody knows what it is. And I was there for seven years and I think I know what it was. So uh, that's one of the things I'd like to talk about tonight. That's a big part of what I'd like to hear about. That's... <laughs> Uh, I was at Stonehenge the first time in 84, and I walked up, and the first thing that hit me, and it was a very different layout than it is now, um, the first thing that hit me was, the gods are sleeping, but they're sure still not dead, and they're here. It was, you could feel, it was palpable, what you could feel. So, Yeah. I, it... It is a place with with a very strange um, atmosphere. Uh, I think I, I've got to accept that it, it's it's uh, something quite powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I I tend to feel it's quite benign now, although I'm not sure that it always was. Okay. Uh, okay. I've got to come straight out right at the beginning and say I'm a person who's who whose experience of the paranormal is almost completely zero <laughs> okay um, i have i have i've lived in a haunted house for seven years uh, and never had a neither my partner nor i had a, a single haunted experience other people did while we were there but we okay. never mm -hmm. ever had any sort of experience of that sort um mm -hmm. we've we've never sort of had uh, the, these these wonderful um moments of, 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 of vision or anything like that uh, that, that come to people uh, at, at places like Stonehenge. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, but I'm very sympathetic towards that kind of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I can douse uh, oh. and my, my grandfather was a dowser. I discovered this about 15 years ago. Sorry, my great grandfather was a dowser. Um, okay. I've never met him. But he was a dowser. He worked on the coal mines in um, in, in the Mendips in Somerset. Okay. And they used to uh, ask him. He was a consultant in, in his later life. And he came in when they needed to know something about the, the subsurface structure. And he would actually douse for geology. He, he was a, uh, I, I think he was a proper diviner. He, he did the um, divining rods. And um, he would douse for the water and um and be able to give them a very accurate picture of, of whether they could sink a shaft in or and, and run a, a a tunnel in a particular direction because where the faults were where the where the, the water was likely to come through and all sorts of things like that and he had a apparently had this 3d map in his brain of of the whole sort of underlying geology to the extent that on one occasion possibly more he apparently uh, this is all hearsay um mm -hmm. but he was able to there was a, a fall in a fall in the mine and there were some miners trapped he was able to actually um tell them that they had to go to a neighboring mine go out along one of their tunnels at one of their levels and then they'd only have a 20 foot or 30 foot dig to to make a, an escape mm -hmm. tunnel and they did and they got the guys out um fantastic there are so many myths in my family that I have no idea whether that's true or not. <laughs> but he certainly was a dowser. Um, so I, I seem to have inherited that ability. Uh, it's, it's, 
I, I suspect dowsing is a very, very common ability. I think that most, I believe that, that most people can douse to, to some level or other. Uh, I've and never I've really done a bit of dowsing for archaeology. Sorry? I've never really tried it. But did you say you douse for archaeology? Yeah. Um, it's very hit and miss. It's okay. Uh, in in the haunted house that I lived in in Essex, um, we, we we were there for about seven years, and it was a uh, it was actually a, a Templar Manor, Knights Templar Manor, oh. taken over by the Hospitallers. Um, there were uh, there was a chapel there and burials and all sorts of stuff like that, and it was being gradually turned into a um, a, a heritage centre, basically. Okay. Uh, there are two wonderful medieval barns there and there's a uh, a medi uh, there's a 17th century um uh what we used to call a court hall it, it was a um beer making uh, maltings and uh, maltings okay. for, for beer making um in those days uh and various other timber frame buildings there a 15th century wall garden fantastic place to mm. to live we actually lived in the middle of it um that's a dream. And uh, one of the, the chaps that worked on the historic buildings had a friend who was a dowser who wanted to come and try dowsing for archaeology. So he came and he did some pretty impressive stuff. Um, mm -hmm. He he doused for one of the barns. We just sort of set him, yeah, go and douse around the barn there. There's some interesting stuff going on there. See what you can find. And he came back mm -hmm. and said, really weird, you know, there's this barn. And I'm picking up a really strong signal all the way around the barn, but it's not the same distance. So it's like three or four feet out, out from the sides. But at the ends, it's about 11 or 12 feet out. Uh, and the other odd thing is it goes right through the porch in the middle. You know, barns have a sort of porch built mm -hmm. onto the barn where the big doors are. Uh -huh. And it goes straight through that. It's very weird. I don't know what it is. And, and we... We were able to explain. Now he'd never, he'd only been to the site once before. He didn't know what was was going on there, um, but we knew that the, the barn had actually been reduced in size. It was really built with posts going into the ground. Twelfth century, early twelfth century barn. Posts went straight into the ground. They rotted, so the walls started to tilt. It was a massive barn. So they, trimmed it. Now, at the sides, they could trim it just enough room to, to actually work and find decent timber. So right. they trimmed it three feet on either side. At the ends, you can't trim a, a timber frame barn by a couple of feet. It makes sense. You've got to do it by half a bay at least, and half a bay was 11 feet. So he, he found the original outline of Now, we did that, uh, part of the um, one one corner, we, we found some traces of the original uh, foundations, but in two other corners, there was nothing. It had all been excavated away years and years ago, but he was still picking up the light. And that really fascinated the, the two of us that worked there at the time. Right. Um, and so we, we said, teach us. And so we learned to douse and, and he taught us. To, and he, he said, you know, you can't you can't rely on it. You can come in, you can find archaeology, and it's there. Right. And you'll come back um, six months later, and it'll be two metres away, or you won't find it at all. And so much depends on your own mind state at the time, whether you're okay. just being receptive. To it. Now, um, it may there may be all sorts of ways around that. I'm sure there are people listening out here who... who who have doused and, and can say, oh yeah, well, you can get around that by doing this. Yeah, we didn't know that and, and we never did find a um, a reliable way, but dowsing does work for archeology. span It's just not okay. very reliable. Okay. Um, and and the, the mechanical, what they call geophys, um, magnetometry and stuff like that works, it's much more effective and works most of the time. So this is why archeologists tend not to use dowsing. Um, right. It also things that just aren't there, and <laughs> that can that makes sense too. And I apologize to the viewers. I know we're having a little technical with the with the internet or something, um, 
but hopefully everything's getting through clearly enough to uh, understand. And um, I'm sorry, we have low tech studios. Um, so, <laughs> oh, that's, I've never heard of using it that way. And we have a lot of people here that use dowsing um, mostly in paranormal work and such. And I've never put a lot of stock in it. Um, it's too easy for the rods to be moved subconsciously or um, just by your hand gets tired and it slopes a bit or something. And um, I've, I've believed in the possibilities, but I've always needed something as a backup to say, okay, I'll trust that reading. Um, Cause I, 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 I think you, you, you can get some very accurate. I mean, some people are really good with it. I can I can tend to if I get a, a strong reading I can I can pick up the edges of a of a ditch or a pipe or something like that water pipe um, get a flow flow direction uh, which is not necessarily downhill oh in other words you know it can be flowing across a hill or or even if it's a geological thing it can be flowing down into a hill yeah right, right. Um, usually it is flowing more or less downhill but um, yeah, I, I used to take dowsing rods out when I took my archaeology students out just to show them what it was all mm -hmm. about and show them that, so that people didn't sort of say, oh, it's no superstitious nonsense, you know. So it, it does work. Most people can do it. Some people just can't. But right. I, I, my experience is 60%, 70% of people can get something, uh, especially That's... with a nice strong signal. And and we we were doing out, out, outside of a, um, a place called Great Coxwell Barn, we're just a nice bit of grass walking up and down, and and everybody started picking up this this um, flow channel. And I said, yeah, you've okay. got a, you've got a flow channel running, and, and you know it's running downhill. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing on the grass to indicate it. You see, so we went into the barn. Yeah, it's going straight through the barn, and everyone was getting really excited. We said, well, let's see if we can find it on the other side. And we walked out to the other side, and. 70 yards away there's a pond in the bottom uh and 10 yards from the um from the barn was a dirty great manhole cover <laughs> 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 there was a rainwater drain running from next door garden or something right the way uh -huh. diagonally across uh -huh. underneath this barn down to the pond um and we've been tracing this it was so lovely to be able to say today you are guys that's what you've been following you know lift it up there's water running in the bottom of it close it over again uh, it really does work, and you can do it for archaeology. Um, I've doused for sort of pits and post holes and things, found them, located them, excavated them, and been um, within like 15 centimetres, 10 centimetres correct of the depth. Wow. Uh, and then I've been way, way out of other cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a pit there, there's a pit there, and you dig it, and there's nothing. Um, and and you know who knows what it's doing. It's just it's very unreliable mm -hmm. uh, as, as a survey method. But sometimes it, you know it hits pay dirt and, and it, it's quite fun. Well, it seems and like it would be a good way. yeah, and it seems like no, it would be just... a good way to start. Go on. Um, oh, I was going to say it seems like a good way to start on an investigation before you get the ground penetrating radar and all the rest of it. Um, if you're looking for some easy or easy targets, I guess, or um, places to at least start digging while you're waiting for all the science to do its its work. Um, I don't know. It's a fascinating process to me. I don't know how it gets picked up and how, what is it that in a post hole that's going to attract this? Water, I can understand. but something like a post hole or ceramic or the foundations of a barn that have been torn down that have disappeared that's weird yeah the, the, the pit or post hole is is not so difficult when you think about it um resistivity works in the same sort of way resistivity okay. says there's a pit here uh, and i can pick it up uh, and one of the reasons it, resistivity picks it up is because the pit has a different um density to the soil around it it's usually less dense but sometimes it's actually packed with rubble and it's more dense um okay. and and has a different water retention 
And it's oh, as simple as that. The pit, the pit holds water, different amounts of water to the surrounding, so it gives a different reading. Your, your, mm -hmm. your, um, your, your resistivity is essentially electrical current, um, mm -hmm. goes through the water better, so it either gives you a positive or negative reading. Now, so a lot of archaeological dowsing is actually water dowsing. Okay. Um, you're just dowsing for moisture. Uh, but sometimes it gets a bit weirder than that. And, and uh, I don't even pretend to understand how it works. But I know it does. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, it's for me, it's just it's 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 a it's a bit of fun. Uh, if I was running an archaeological dig, I'm, I'm afraid I'd probably fork out for the uh, for the resistivity <laughs> survey <laughs> because you've got a much, much, much better chance of actually um, especially with modern sort of techniques. You know, it's come a long way since the, the 70s and 80s when I learned about it. Right. Um, it's, it's a lot better now, yeah. You, you need to be a, a, a scientist in a different way anymore, it seems like. Between all the chemistry that's involved in research now and the technical equipment, um, archaeology has become a more of a many discipline form it seems like i think it's always been well it's certainly been that way since the, the 60s okay. um and and yeah it's it's i think it's it's becoming uh, more widely known that mm -hmm. you know pe people are more aware of it because of programs like the time team and and that kind of and, and the, the number of television channels we have that do archaeology programs, uh, whether they do them well or not, is another is another matter. But um, you, we, we we're much more aware of, of those sorts of uh, of procedures. Um, when I started doing archaeology back in the seventies, they were still talking about actually this was in in South Africa, admittedly. Uh, they were still talking about um, being able to do a, a a Bachelor of Science degree in archaeology. Okay. At the time, it was all BA. It was all uh, Bachelor of Arts, and mm -hmm. you couldn't do a BSc. And about the time that I finished my first degree, um, they, uh, they they introduced a BSc for for archaeology um, to do things like we we did um, preparation of radiocarbon samples in in Cape Town. Uh, we had a, a carbon isotope lab there, which um, I used to work in sometimes, although I, I was never my official role. Um, I just had, uh, when I was a postgrad student, I had a little cubicle uh, next to the lab. And so ended up having coffee and, and helping out with the, in the lab quite frequently. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, we, we worked with the material science section. We worked with uh, scanning electron microscopes and transmission electron microscopes and all sorts of, of, of fancy doodars that um, we had a we had a very um, scientifically orientated uh, professor and he promoted the, the, the science side of it quite a lot so we all got a chance to, to do quite a bit and I've never regretted it uh, it's not my forte it's not what I do mm -hmm. but uh, I, I've never regretted knowing, having that background knowledge and being able to to work with, understand when I read reports and things like that. It's, it's been really useful. Great. What yeah. is your specialty with archaeology? What is it that you have done? I, I was trained as a prehistorian and I was okay. trained as, a, as, a, as a, essentially as an excavator. Um, but when I trained um in in cape town we, we you had to be a jack of all trades anyway so mm -hmm. i i learned to do animal bone i learned to um analyze my own pottery uh i learned to do flint tools that, that i you know cataloged and, and identified and worked on tens of thousands of, of um well not mostly not flints actually um they it, this was most of them were, were done in in southern africa in south africa and um they were technically not flints, but they're similar sort of um, cryptocrystalline, microcrystalline, uh, quartzitic okay. materials. So uh, jaspers, chalcedonies, things like that, silkretes. Okay. 
same stuff that, that uh, Stonehenge is made of, interestingly. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a symmetry. But a slightly that. finer grade. Okay. A slightly finer grade of silkrete. But yeah, so initially I was I was that when I came back to UK um, in the in in 1986, uh, prehistoric archaeology was was done by the universities. Um, you couldn't just walk out and get a job doing prehistoric archaeology. You've got a job doing um, archaeology for a local unit or for for a local um, county or. or, or um, town unit or something like that and you did whatever was put in front of you what got put in front of me when I was doing it was uh, medieval and post medieval archaeology which okay. I did 10, 12, 14 years I think <laughs> um, <laughs> with the odd little bits of, of well one little bit, couple of little bits of Roman uh, and then very odd little bits of, of you know, a Bronze Age trench here or, or um, uh, an Iron Age pit there, or something like that. Really, only the last um, af after two thousand when I came, or nineteen ninety eight when I came here to um, Wiltshire. That was when I first again got the opportunity to to actually work with prehistoric stuff and um, on on sites which were essentially prehistoric. Uh, so I went back to it like a duck to water. Mm -hmm. Where I want to be, but I've got a very broad um, background, which is mostly in excavation, but also uh, because I was I was taught to do it, uh, I, I've got a fair sort of knowledge of, of finds as well. Okay. Um, I also, given what this is, and this is not a program about archaeology, and it's a program about um, paranormal things and and. Uh, the odd well, it's aside, all related. Uh, it's all related. Sorry. Well, it it's is. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in South Africa, uh, I was working on Stone Age material. Um, okay. There were three or four of us working in a research unit, and I was doing straight excavations and and um, stone tool analysis and that sort of things. Very standard archaeology. Two other guys were working on. Um, rock art analysis and they were doing surveys of in fact there were eventually there were three or four people associated with the university or the museum all working on on various aspects of rock art in in cape um and putting together a huge body of of information um into that mix during the 70s came a man called uh, david lewis williams and david was a was a school teacher um, who had got involved in archaeology and had gone through and taken a degree and taken a postgraduate degree and um, in around about 1968 I think I can't remember exactly when it was he um, did a PhD all on rock art and then the interpretation okay. of rock art um, and he had a radically different view to a lot of other people and it took many many years uh, when I was working there in the in the late 70s we had hours and hours of arguments with with David about his interpretation of rock art and what what um, what cave painting actually meant and what it was what it was there for and um, and he stuck to his guns and he gradually managed to persuade pretty much all of us that um, if he wasn't a hundred percent right he was certainly barking up the right tree Excellent. and very loudly and yeah and. Um, then I, I went to work in uh, at the University of Fatasrand, and I actually worked in the same department with him for a year, and got to know him a lot better, and got to know his his work a lot better, um, got to understand him, and I've I've been pretty much a, a supporter of his way of thinking, um, and his interpretation is that is that all of the paleo the Paleolithic rock art of um, Europe, as well as the stuff in Southern Africa. Is all either shamans? Sorry. Uh, you sorry that that last part. Um, all of the rock art is basically, and then it broke up. <laughs> sorry uh, it, about that. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's that's 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 the that's the um, the demons coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the, the, 
he, it was, it's all interpretable in terms of um, shaman's experience. So okay. shamans probably more about this than I do, but shamans uh, tend to uh, contact the spirit world by going into various states of trance. Um, it can be drug induced, it can be rhythm induced, it can be all, all ways of going in, but they, they tend to, to do this by going into trance. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, it's breaking you up a little me? bit. And your, yeah. your face keeps Yeah, I've lost you now, but I can hear you. There we go. Okay. Um, yes. I don't know how to fix it. I, I don't know if it's fixable. Um, I, it's, it's probably just uh, an internet or a program glitch. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway. So shamanic trance experience. Uh, there are, I, I, I don't know how much time we'd have to go into the details of it, but um, there are basically a series of, of um, sets of images which are found throughout rock art, which are relatable back to um, images which are uh, or seen by people going into and, and in trance. So there's the whole idea that people first of all see geometric shapes and zigzags and hatchwork patterns, that, um, hatched patterns and uh, dots all over the place. And, and that kind of, uh, that's the lowest level of trance. You gradually build up and you, you start to interpret those in terms of um, animals and things that you are familiar with. Okay. So that explains with. They stop being... that explains and some of the the carvings that you see in stone all over with anything from circles to wave lines to holes to spirals yes as well uh -huh. yeah um, but his theory was that it was all related to that now mm -hmm. i i've i said to you earlier don't uh, go along with that its entirety but i do see that there's a there's a lot of it there's too much of it to be simply coincidental mm -hmm. uh, and it's too widespread okay so he was saying basically it's it's all about shamans and shamans are trying to communicate or to set themselves up to go into trance or with that we can't say we can't say why they're doing it but it's the shamans doing the paintings and the engravings and um and what they're doing it for is connected to the shamanic experience um, of, of trancing and, and healing and searching in the spirit world and contact with the spirit world. Um, and that was the basis of, it, of his, uh, his hypothesis. And, and we all wanted to say that rock art was rock art and it was cultural and all sorts of other things. Um, and eventually he, he managed to persuade most of archaeologists in working in southern Africa and and some of the French archaeologists, not very many, but a few of the French archaeologists to um, to have a look at his stuff and, and really take it a bit more seriously. And he's now quite well thought of uh, in, in a lot of fields, although I, I, I know he's, he's far from universally accepted. Right. But um, that idea that 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 shamanism was was this almost global religion way back in prehistory back in the in the paleolithic 25,000 years ago um going up through into modern times to 12 14,000 years ago and less in, in the rock art of southern africa has has paintings of of europeans with muskets um now this is one of the sort of things that we used to argue and say well, it's nothing to do with trance and he said, no we, can be because it's all to do with, it's all to do with power and it's all to do with um the 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 the, the um the life force that, that these things are that are involved and the transmission of the life force and, and once the those things are known to once certain things are known to people they can become part of the trance experience um and he argued that we argued back and forth for years but we did eventually get uh, uh, some sort of agreement. So I've always followed that, and I've always accepted that that's um, a pretty good way of looking at uh, rock art. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the 
80s, 90s? I can't remember when it was now. <laughs> Probably won't be able to read this without my glasses on now. Two thousand and five. Um, he produced this book. Where is it? Inside, Inside the Neolithic Mind. Okay. Um, it's it's David Lewis Williams and someone called a chap called David Pierce, uh, and and they took the the idea of, of shamanism and, and art and shamanism and archaeology, and um, pulled it forward into the Neolithic, and they looked at the Near East. And they looked at um, some of the the Neolithic tombs in Brit in Britain, particularly uh, the Boyne Valley and um, Bryn Kelly Do in in, in um, Anglesey. Uh, they they deliberately avoided Stonehenge because of the controversy that is always associated with anyone interpreting Stonehenge. Right. But, um, right. He says somewhere in it, I think it's in the introduction, that you know he thinks Stonehenge fits the model perfectly. Uh, okay. He just okay. he just didn't want to use it as an example because he was just opening a pit for himself to be thrown into. Exactly. Um, sorry. I said exactly. Yeah. 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 And mm -hmm. he would have. It would have been. Mm -hmm. So that made me start thinking about that, and then uh, I didn't have. As I said, when I was practicing archaeology, I didn't have a lot to do with with, uh, with that side of it, with prehistoric archaeology. Um, when I was teaching, part of the syllabus I was teaching was the origins of um, religion ah. in archaeology. So, and even back then, this was, this was back in the early two thousands. Uh, there was, you know, we were talking about um, shamanism and uh, um, animal uh, animatism mm -hmm. and um, animism as 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 uh, ideas that from which the the earliest religions started to spring and this develop a development of of religion from a belief in supernatural elements to suit to spirits uh, and then the spirits become gods and and the and the nature of religion changes as as the the shamans become priests and, and you get organized religion developing in in civilization and there's this huge run of things um and i learned a lot about it in, in those i didn't apply it then i went to Stonehenge eight years ago now um and i'm faced with this sort of massive structure in front of me and um and being asked questions by members of the public what is it did the aliens build it and things like that um and and i started i spent a lot of time as you, as you would when you're staring at it eight hours a day um thinking about it and and uh, reading about it and learning i i thought i knew all about stonehenge when i arrived there and mm -hmm. i realized in a fairly short space of time you know there were there were people there with no archaeological background who knew three times as much about it as I did um, and I sat down and started to learn about it and uh, basically yeah I, I, I've sort of I've been studying it since then um, and about four years ago I suppose four and a half years ago I I had a bit of a, a an epiphany and uh, mm -hmm. thought I, I started to understand why I thought why Stonehenge was there. Um, difficulty being uh, that you can't prove it. Right. It's very, very difficult to prove uh, a lot of these um, religious and, and um, supernatural uh, explanations uh, in terms of archaeology because they don't leave the information there. And, and the, the, the swine that, that built Stonehenge just didn't leave us any decent art. I know. It's not like, it's not like Newgrange. It's absolutely covered in the stuff, you know, or, or, right. or Dalf. Or, or Nalf. Um, there's hardly any. 
There's, there's a little no bit of dubious manuscripts. Well. They didn't leave behind anything at all, like, you know, a, I know, it's just, a how-to it's book just, or, yeah. So selfish. So I completely know. selfish. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway. So, yeah, so the, the epiphany was came about with um, one of my colleagues who was, who was a, a you, sh- you might one day want to get on this show. Um, Simon uh, said to me that Simon Banton, this is it's his name. Um, okay. Simon was telling me about the uh, the monument as as he's an he's an archaeoastronomer, and he was telling me about the monument as as in, in terms of its its astronomical um, importance, which I knew absolutely nothing about. And I okay. still don't know a great deal about it, I must admit. But um, I listened to what he had to say. And the thing that hit me was when he pointed out the, the horizon. And I, I looked at the horizon of Stonehenge and he said, it's level all the way around. He said, it's been measured. Um, and it's I, I think it's within a degree, pretty much. I mean, there are dips in it and things like mm-hmm. that. But just about any point of the horizon where you'd say that's the horizon, the line of the horizon, you can run a theodolite all the way around there and it, and it stays pretty much the same and basically if you move it up yeah. or da- stonehenge up or down the slope or ra- off the slope where it is you lose that you tilt the horizon um so to get that level horizon stonehenge has got to be where it is and the other important thing is that stonehenge always had that horizon it had a clear horizon the evidence limited as it is uh for vegetation in in the on, on that part of the plain is that the trees and and forest the woodland was was all in the valleys and the upland parts were all grass so there might have been occasional trees there might have been even a clump of trees but 99.9 percent of the horizon was going to be clear and horizontal and that must be an almost unique um situation in britain with it having this horizontal horizon all the way around. And when you stand in Stonehenge and you look, it looks as if you're in the center of that, that horizon, you know, you're, you're smack in the middle. Right. If you've drawn a circle all the way around you, you're not. Some of the horizon is actually a lot closer than, than others, but it, it does feel as if you're right in the center. And that's the important thing is the, is the feeling. Um, the other thing that all archaeologists say about Stonehenge was that there's uh, Parker Pearson. We, we talked about Mike Parker Pearson earlier. Um, right. When he did the Stonehenge Riverside project, uh, one of the things they did was they cut a couple of trenches across the um, the avenue. Right. And they found, apart from the ditches on either side, that there was a natural hollow which followed the line of the, um, the avenue from Stonehenge down into the dip, down into the valley, what they call Stonehenge Bottom. Okay. And that in that, there were a lot of little... Um, gullies. They're only a few inches across and, and, and um, maybe eight or nine inches deep, something like that. Uh, I may be wrong on the depth, but then they're not they're not huge. Right. Um, and they were interpreted by geologists and geomorphologists as well as archaeologists uh, as um, as runoff from a glacial meltwater runoff. Mm-hmm. Now that doesn't mean there was a glacier over Stonehenge. It means that uh, there was permafrost, so that hill was frozen. Okay. And, the ground. and once the we come to the end of the ice age, all that frozen ground melts, and and you get these these spring runoffs for, you know, maybe two or three hundred years, and they create these little gullies running down the hill. The group that runs down the line of the avenue is not unique on the hillside. There are others scattered mm-hmm. along that one lines up perfectly with the solstice alignment so, um what is it midsummer sunrise midwinter sunset isn't it yeah right. um so and it's possible that certainly in the late mesolithic that people would have still been able to see on the surface the sort of parch mark effects or the negative parch marks of of this these little gullies the grass okay. was a bit taller, you'd get these crop marks showing up. 
or, or possibly when the, the ground dried out, you'd get these darker green lines showing up. Mm -hmm. By mm -hmm. the, the high Neolithic, the end of the Neolithic, it's quite possible that was no longer visible, but people knew about it by that stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People walked up there, must, must have seen that, walked up the hill, and when they got to the top, they came to this wonderful place, which was um, this, this natural... They, they were sitting in the middle of the record player, you know? Right. <laughs> now, Simon said, that's great. It's, 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 this is a wonderful place to actually view the rising and setting of the stars and the movement of the stars throughout and, and record it throughout the year. Um, but everybody would agree that you don't uh, keep checking on, on those sorts of things by putting 30 ton stones up and sinking them, you know, six or eight feet into the ground. It's just right. totally impractical. Right. If you get it wrong, you've got to move them. Yeah. So you don't do that. You do it with sticks. Uh, and Stonehenge isn't that kind of an observatory. But there's something special about that horizon, something special about that. And what hit me was I had just literally about three months before uh, been reading back on onto some of the stuff I've been teaching about. Um, shamanic cosmologies okay and shamanic okay. cosmologies all over the world um such that as survive so you know um but particularly the the siberian and the american ones and and to some extent um, north african ones uh and early christian cosmologies they're all very much the same if you see illustrations of them they all look the same you've got the yes. surface which is, is the earth. In some cases, you've got the, the, the pillars of heaven holding holding the, the heavens up. You've got some places you've got a tree or, or a mountain in the middle. Mm -hmm. But generally, that disc, you've got an arch of heavens above you. Yeah. With the um, various elements in it, but usually the Milky Way and, and things like that. And then underneath, you've got a series, you've got the underworld. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's the underground sea as well. Um, and invariably, there are numbers of, of levels of of, um, of uh, spirit planes in in the world above you, and and in the underworld underneath you. I'm not explaining this terribly well, but there are there are always as above, so below. You always get the same number below as you you have above. But we're the center line. Okay. The, the surface that we live on, where we live with the spirit world, is. Um, is, is this this thin crust of, 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 of the world. And it's usually, not always, but usually depicted as a sort of a circle. Yeah. Now, yes. if you walk and, and you're seeing this, this amazing alignment and you walk up and you come up into this little area and you stand and you say, this is like being in the middle of the, the universe. This is like being right in the center of the cosmos. Here's the heavens above us. We've got a perfect view of the heavens. We know that we've got the uh, the underworld underneath us. Within a few miles of Stonehenge, there are two very deep shafts that go into the chalk, and they okay. they go. I think one's about ninety foot and one's over a hundred feet down into the chalk. These are Neolithic shafts that were dug for heaven knows what reason. They knew that the chalk went down forever. You know, there's there's like 900 feet of chalk under underneath Stonehenge. It's right on the top of the of the, both the, the the layers of chalk on the South Downs of yes. Britain. Um, there's a huge depth of chalk underneath it. As far as they were concerned, it must have been the chalk went down forever to the bottom of the world. So you've right. got the underworld. However many levels you want, it's all the same stuff. You've got the heavens up, and you've got the the um, circular level disc of, of the world and i thought that's what stonehenge is that's why stonehenge is here it's because it's symbolically not really they weren't stupid no symbolically yeah. at the center of the universe and it's a place of magic it's a place where you do magic um mm -hmm. if you're if you're you know we we have this sort of well, we have two different views of magic, don't we? We have the, the sleight of hand side of magic. Right. And uh, we have these sort of magicians and wizards and that that kind of spell magic. Mm -hmm. um, 
and this is the spell magic type but it's the uh it, it was done in, in a time before people we would call witches and wizards. When, when shamans were doing things, they were going into trance. They were visiting other worlds and they were bringing back miracle cures for whatever ills it was, social ills as well as um, physical ones. OK. Um, and to actually, you know, if you, if you do any sort of magic like that, you have... You have two things to. No, I'm, I'm really not explaining this well. No, um, it's making sense to me. I, I'm fascinated. The the whole thing is that what you what you're looking at with Stonehenge, and that landscape, is is a model of the cosmos. Okay. Um, it's it's what you you could call a microcosm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there right. is a magical terminology which I don't understand fully. But uh, basically, if you if you do magic to a microcosm, it affects the macrocosm. Oh, right. So it's, uh, it's same as voodoo. If you have a, a voodoo doll and you stick pins in it, the real person feels pain. Yeah. Right. It's mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's is it called referred magic? I I'm not sure. I'm not um, sure. But uh, it so Stonehenge then becomes a very important place because if you do things. Um, if you carry out spells there to do with the weather or to do with uh, the well-being of the people or, or to do with making peace on earth and, and all that sort of stuff, um, whatever you, whatever magic you do at Stonehenge doesn't just affect the local area. Stonehenge is, is, is so much was seen from very, I think in those days uh, as, as very much more than a local axis mundi. It's, it's a, it's an, it's a worldwide one. Okay. Um, and last week, I think um, Matt and and, uh, and Ruby talked about the shaman that we had at Stonehenge who used to come and visit us, Siobhan. Right. Um, and Siobhan said that when she was at Stonehenge, she was visited by a couple of um, uh, Aboriginal people, Australian okay. Aboriginals, who came in and said, yeah, we know about Stonehenge. We know what you're doing here. We know about you. Um, this is this is the axis of the world. This is one of the axes of the world, and this is one end of it, and the other end is somewhere in Australia. Um, okay. And and they had this this they'd made this connection. They they visualised that. Uh, she felt that it was it was an axis of of time as well as an axis of world, and and I've unashamedly pinched that for my for my novel. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is this, it's this idea that what you do at Stonehenge can affect not just Stonehenge but the whole world. Yeah, and they yeah. they were well aware that the world was a much bigger place. Right. Well, Stonehenge and Woodhenge, from my understanding and my trips there, they had people from all over the British Isles coming to these locations and using them. Um, as for ritual and for, I mean, for all kinds of things. And so I would, to me, that would be easily interpret into the monument being part of a worldwide whole because basically their world came to it. Yeah. Is that I mean, overly simplified? Well, I think, I think you have to really, so, because we, we're never going to know I don't believe we're ever going to know the, the details. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Stonehenge as a structure is is a is a fascinating building, and it's one it's the earliest um, non burial building uh, in Britain. Stone stone okay. building in Britain. Um, Isn't Ave? I thought Avebury was older. Maybe not. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let me I'm redefine. Sorry. Then. No, no, yeah. no. That's right. No, I, I, I said I'm not expressing myself all that well tonight. Um, Avebury is is older than well. Stonehenge starts in 3000 BC, roughly. That's um, right. That's mm -hmm. that's the blue stone circle. If we believe in the blue stone circle, which I do, um, and and the Henge monument, the bank and the ditch. Uh, mm -hmm. That's 3000 BC. Um, 
And then you've got the second phase, which is the sort of regeneration, the rebirth of Stonehenge and the building of the, the amazing stone building in the middle. Right. Okay. Now, I call that a building because it's uh, it's a planned structure and and it's jointed and it has um, stones put on top of other stones, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, and it's got rooms within it and, and subdivisions within it. Now, Avebury is a stone circle, massive stones, absolutely stonkingly massive ditch. You know, it puts, mm -hmm. puts um, Stonehenge to shame for the ditch and just about every other circle to shame for the ditch. More stones, um, much, much bigger, mm -hmm. uh, two circles within it, but they are just, they are unshaped stones dug into holes and, and put into the ground. Now, okay. uh, Avebury is, so I, I, when I'm saying building, I'm, I'm just meaning they've gone a little bit further than other stone circles. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense now because Avebury okay. didn't yeah. have the lentils, they didn't have the cirrus, the, the whole they didn't have the shape part of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. The interesting thing about Avebury that you bring up, um, Avebury comes in, Avebury is very badly dated. So okay. uh, we're, we're fairly certain. I think there is this one date of about 2,800 or 2,900 from the bottom of the bank. That means it's, it's the old soil level underneath the bank. Right. Uh, and then there are other dates which are between 2,600 and 2,500. And Avery's and, and there are not very many of any of, of either of them. I think there's one from under the, the bank, and, and then there's about two or three from from the later periods. Uh, Avery somewhere in that period, between 2,800 and, and, and about 2,500. And that most puts, people uh, that puts it newer than Stonehenge, than the original, well, the it's, oldest it's part. Newer than phase one, but mm -hmm. earlier than phase two. I have a yes. theory about that, which is is not in in the least bit metaphysical, but, but um, is that uh, Stonehenge is built phase one with all the stuff mm -hmm. that I said about it being a um, it being the center of the universe and all that stuff. It becomes an incredibly important site. Now, right. someone decides to build for whatever reason uh, at Avebury, um, and they they build a structure and they build a, 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 a myth around it or a story around it that makes it very powerful and makes it much more popular. So a lot of effort is put in there. You get the building of Silbury Hill, you get the sanctuary, you get the avenues built on, all, all this sort of extra activity that goes on for several, a couple of hundred years. Um, mm -hmm. Avery. Stonehenge then comes along and the people at Stonehenge decide that they're going to build this wonderful temple. Let's call it a temple because that's what it is. Right. It's right. wonderful stone temple at Stonehenge. And um, and after that, within a hundred years or so of, of that being built, everything stops at, at Avebury. Doesn't it? Doesn't become abandoned or anything? No. But the development <laughs> stops. The interest stops. Stone uh, Avebury becomes more more of a backwater again. And I think there's there's got to have been a, a tremendous rivalry between these two areas. Um, what started it who who knows but you know you've got stonehenge then avebury comes and completely eclipses stonehenge and we know that about 2700 2750 stonehenge go is almost abandoned okay it's about a 200 year period when there's there's almost nothing happening at stonehenge all the initial burials all the initial cremations are in that uh, are either slightly older than than stonehenge itself or within those those 200 those 200 years um, okay. after Stonehenge built to about 2,800, 2,700. Be generous, 2,700. And then there are a few uh, burials that come in around the 2,500 at the time that the, the, the temple is, is, is rebuilt and, and, and there's a whole new structure at Stonehenge. And there are literally, I think there are dates on two, um, from two burials. I may be wrong on that. I think there are dates on two burials um from that period two cremations from that period okay um, it becomes very very rare there's there's a 
but the the cremation um, cemetery that Stonehenge is famous for is all before the building of Avebury. Right. And once Stonehenge too is built, Avebury goes into decline. And they must have hated each other's guts. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it brings up a question to me. How much were the religious authorities using these as power and con control and wealth mechanisms? I mean, a little later in history, when you're looking at some of the, the Greek and earlier temple sites in the in the Middle Eastern areas and such, they did things. They had sand in such a way that the doors would open and close hydraulics mm. with, that was sand instead of water because there wasn't any water or they had echo chambers built in such a way that the strange sounds could come out or i mean there are all kinds of things they did to give the show of tapping into a divine presence of some kind that you couldn't see physically um yeah and could that kind of basically cynicism that started that early i'm sure it did i'm sure I, I i would think that some of that cynicism as you put it is is pretty much human nature um okay. but then i'm a cynic <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah you talk about the the control and you talk about the the hierarchy and leadership the 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 the, the amazing thing about stonehenge and avery is that they they're at this bit in the middle of, of the, the trajectory of change from hunter-gatherers through to something approaching civilization, mm -hmm. um, the sort of complex hierarchical tribal, possibly even slightly heading towards kingdoms uh, style of, of a structure of society that we had in the Iron Age. Right. Um, right. So you've got Mesolithic egalitarian hunter-gatherers and somewhere at the other end you've got uh, Iron Age society with with massive tribes and kings and uh, sorry not kings but uh, um, chieftains of, of some sort or another. You've also got a religious transition as well. You've got this shamanic tradition at the one end, uh, which one assumes, and it is only an assumption, is very similar to existing hunter gatherer groups around the world, or, or existing mm -hmm. hunter gatherer groups at the beginning of the last century around the world. Right. Um, right. Where they literally, you know, your practitioners are part timers. Nobody's a priest. The shaman okay. comes in. Okay. Someone who's good at being a shaman gets asked to do a to do a, a shamanic ritual. And at a, a special time, they get together and, and they they do rituals together. And they work together mm -hmm. to do dances for various things and trancing for various things. Um, and to heal social problems and and mm -hmm. as well as doing the individual stuff um, but there's no full-time priesthood and there's no social hierarchy that's the one and that's the mesolithic okay right if we go through, we're talking specifically about northwestern europe and britain here yeah not talking yes. about the middle east that's much more complicated and, and there's different things going on there exactly when we get through to the iron age we've got these complex societies hereditary kings or hereditary chiefs um we've got the druids we've got um a priesthood an established priesthood of several hundred years we're not absolutely sure how far they go back but they go back you know at mm -hmm. least sort of um to four or five hundred bc or possibly a bit earlier than that okay um and and then you've got the, the the mass of people underneath it so you've got a, a, a hierarchical society with an organized priesthood the priesthood are not the people running the show they're not the chiefs the chiefs are are and are a secular um group of people right and they they they're not connected directly to the druids as far as we know uh mm -hmm. Some stage in between, you've got this, this change from the one society to the other society. You've got the growth of, of full time priests. You've got the growth of full time and leaders. Right. And we're seeing the, the, 
the beginning of the Bronze Age and the end of the Neolithic is, is somewhere in the middle of that. Well, the other thing okay. you've got is you've probably got back in the Mesolithic, you've got uh, a, a set of beliefs in, in um, a spirit world. Uh, no, no gods, probably. Um, no, certainly no images of gods, except in Lepensky Veer in the Danube Valley. You know, is the closest one to to Britain. Um, no real images of gods or or of any portrayal of of anything other than the spirit world in, in occasional bits of art. Um, when you get through to the Iron Age, we know they've got a, a full uh, pantheon of gods, uh, the equivalent at least of, of, of the Roman pantheons. Uh, they like the Romans. They still have house spirits, and they still have. Um, there is still a spirit world. There are lesser mm -hmm. things that are not gods than spirits. Right. Uh, but there are ancestral spirits that you still, you know, the Romans still um, made a, a very big deal of their ancestor spirits, the Lares. You, right. Um, right. So we, we haven't totally lost the spirit world and, and gone over to um, a set of gods. I don't think we ever did. I don't think anybody ever did that, really, but... Um, I don't think so. It's it's the development of gods. Did we have gods at the time of Stonehenge? Did we have full time priests at the time of Stonehenge? And the answer is we haven't a clue. We don't know. Okay. But there are there are idea there are things there are clues which which kind of point to that we're getting there. There's all the solar alignments um, and and lunar alignments. The, an emphasis on throughout the Neolithic and, and into the Bronze Age on, on solar and lunar alignment. Now that might just mean that uh, the sun and the moon are important. It could mean, and lots of people have suggested this over the, the decades, that the sun and the moon were, were seen as gods. That we had sun worshippers, you know, worship in the, in the sense of, of worshipping gods rather than consulting with spirits. Um, so it's just possible that we we we're kind of there already. We've got the first mm -hmm. gods, um, maybe a god of you know we, we've got Gaia and we've got maybe a god of of the waters or something like that. Half a dozen gods, lots and lots of spirits. Mm -hmm. Or it may be, and I I tend to lean this way is that we haven't quite got there yet. That we're still dealing with a essentially a, a world of spirits, uh, and and there is even the sun and the moon might have great respect but they're not yet worshipped as gods mm -hmm. that's a very personal of the, of the trajectory and where we are on it and there's not an, a shred of evidence really one way or the other um, so I, 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 I say that quite happily I, I, um, as far as uh, social structure is concerned and social leadership is concerned we're in exactly the same boat we're no longer dealing with isolated little groups. Someone is controlling um, groups or, or, or so, society, social groups to be able to build things like Avery and Stonehenge, to be able to build things longer ago than that, like, like um, Newgrange and, and, and these massive chambered tombs. Um, someone is organising it, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and they are there's there's a lot of work goes into that now it's either it could be religious leaders these are all in one way or another they're all religious structures we don't get in britain at least uh we don't get sort of massive meeting halls right or, or, um, stone fortresses being built at that time mm -hmm. everything is, is built in the neolithic and, and into the early bronze age has a religious interpretation. So it's quite possible that the leaders of the society were still religious. Mm -hmm. um, whether they were permanent leaders or whether they were, um, what, there's an African tribe and I can't remember who it is, I think it's the Nua, um, who have things called, or people called leopard skin chiefs. This is going back in, in, in I mean, the, the Nua are as, are as modernized as any other African society now, but back in the day, they were mainly pastoralists and, um, and, and they, they had this, they had a system where 
people took on leadership when it was needed. Oh. Okay, so we're in a time of famine. We need someone to get us out of this problem. Um, mm -hmm. Joe over there, he's really good at these sorts of solutions. So we ask him and he says, yeah, okay, reluctantly, I'll, I'll become the chief. And he literally puts on the leopard skin cloak and he becomes the okay. leopard skin chief. Mm -hmm. As soon as he's sorted out the problem or it solves itself or whatever, as soon as that he's no longer needed, he takes it off again and he goes back to being Joe. Um, okay. he's, nobody has the, the desire to carry on. They don't have the right to carry on. They're temporary leaders. Uh, and that's something that's quite common in pastoral peoples. Um, and Stonehenge was an essentially, the, or Wiltshire was an essentially pastoral society. So it's possible that that's all we're looking at. Or we could have the beginnings of hereditary chef. We know that early in the Bronze Age, we've got really important people being buried in individual graves, in individual earth mounds, something we've never seen before. Um, are these people chiefs? Some of them have certainly got special grave goods given to them, or are they really? Yeah. yeah. Um, the simple answer is we don't know as yet. I think we may learn those answers, uh, but we don't know as yet. But there is definitely the beginnings of a, of, of a separation. There are people who are at the top of society. There are people who are that 5% who are getting buried, who are getting buried at Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. Who are getting buried in these mounds? Who are getting buried in the in the long barrows, even? Mm -hmm. And buried that with wealth. Sort of, yeah, that with... sort of um, elite is 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 beginning to exist, and it's it's start and and we're starting to get that elite affecting a much wider population, which can then be drawn on as a labour for these these communal um, uh, works for for religious purposes. Right. And this is a very long-winded answer. I'm sorry. Oh, I love <laughs> I just, it. No, I, I this... just, just realized that what, what we what I started talking about was when you were talking about the the um, the, the 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 jealousy, the the um, rivalry that might have existed between these two places, um, and the leaders might have have been uh, feeling a bit cynical towards each other. But um, the the point is that he, that these um, monuments, these great monuments like like Avebury and and uh, Stonehenge, aren't just religious buildings. They are also political statements. Okay. They're also <laughs> saying we're the most important people around. Look at yeah. us. Yep. Look at us. Look at the size of our ditch. Look at the size of the stones we've dragged up here. And Stonehenge, they haven't got the space to to compete with Avebury. But what they could do was that they could build the building mm -hmm. and do what nobody else had done before. And I, I must always say, I, I must say, I always used to tell the visitors when they, they came and said, and I'm, I'm willing to bet the guys that did all that work, and it's a huge amount of work. There's actually more work in Stonehenge than there is in, in Avebury, and Avebury's mm -hmm. massive. Um, and most of that work is in shaping the stones and putting them up and putting the ones on the lintels on and that sort of thing. And I reckon the guys that built it went away and they said, go back to your own people now. And for God's sake, just tell them, don't ever, ever do anything like this. <laughs> it's just <laughs> too much work. <laughs> and it works, right. you know, it works just as well without it. Um, and that's why there was never another Stonehenge. <laughs> That makes sense. I like that idea. And, you know, you're in what you're talking about, too, fits. I I read an article, oh, in the last year, and I don't even remember what it, what publication it was in, but it was talking about the need for re, the creation of religion in order to create society and cities and starting to have that much more complex civilization more than just family units or small tribal units because you there had to be an identity to bring people together something that said we're all part of this and mm. if you're getting people named brown coming with people named jones well they don't have that name in common anymore so 
there's got to be something else. And it was an interesting idea. I'm not going to say, I mean, the way it was written, it made sense. But what you've just said shows where that could be part of it. If yeah, I'm not very articulate. It doesn't today, have to but, be a separation. It doesn't. Right. It, it, we we see these things as very different. Um, but you don't have to go back that far in, in European history till you see, you know, the, the people who are the religious leaders and the people who are the secular leaders are actually all the same families. Mm -hmm. they, they're, well, not quite the same, they're not quite the same people, but they're the same families. The head um, of the Church of England is your queen. That's pretty well tied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um <laughs> Yeah, so 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 there's there's no reason why people who are religious leaders couldn't also be um, couldn't also become or be mm -hmm. the uh, social leaders, the political leaders. And there's no doubt that dirty great communal monuments like Stonehenge, Avebury, and and before them the the great the Kursus and the um, uh, and, and the uh, Causeway enclosures and things like that. All these these big communal monuments, um, they they have a they make a political statement, a social statement, as well as a religious statement. Yeah, the long barrow. Stick a long barrow up on the top of it. This is this is our spiritual home. This is our center. This is our our heart. This is where our mm -hmm. ancestors are buried. This is where we bury the best of our ancestors. This is what ties us to the land. And we make a right. monument of it. We're telling other people, this is our land. This is where our people live. Uh, it's it's a political statement as much as it is a, a religious state. Um, yeah. Although the purpose, is, the purpose ostensibly is, is religious. Um, right. And I don't think Stonehenge is any different to that. But, you know, they must have, they were trying to impress someone when they built Stonehenge. Because it's just right. so much work. It's just so over the top. Unless it was aliens, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I, don't gets... believe, I don't believe the aliens, but... I don't either. I get angry that people think hu humans were so stupid we couldn't figure out how to do these things on our own. Oh, they couldn't have built the pyramids. You know, it had to have been aliens. Rubbish. We have yeah. lots of ideas how. We have ideas how Stonehenge was built. I mean, there it could have been done a different way than, but they've done the, the um, oh, what's the term? The practical archaeology. I mean, they've they've done the experiments where they've found ways with what was available at the time to move and shape the stones. And um, yeah, and yeah, so. You were kidding, but I just put that in there because there's so many people out there. And especially when you oh, yeah. start dealing with paranormal fields and such that every crazy conspiracy in it. I I have a degree in history and a master's in public administration. I just don't fall for it. <laughs> I I need the solid. Um, we've well, been going well, and you... I'd like to, I'd like uh, this conversation is fantastic. But before we end. I want to give you a chance to talk more about your book. I really haven't spoken about it, have I? I'm terrible. No. And <laughs> I'm well, I'm a terrible promises. host because I haven't, I haven't pulled that out. But what you've been saying is just okay. been fascinating. Um, all the things that I was telling, I was saying about the, the this epiphany moment with Stonehenge and, and understanding, or beginning beginning to understand why Stonehenge was there. And, and beginning to sort of integrate it into a, a, a social and religious background and, and trying to get it, starting to cement the ideas together about what I, how I thought it all worked. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to write something about it. And, and I actually sat down and tried to, to write a couple of um, archaeological articles. And I got bogged down every time. And, and the reason is because it really is you, you're you're, you're playing there all the time. There's there's so much that that is um, that is unknown, and that we just don't we cannot pin down at the moment. Uh, that it is it's just a theory. Mm -hmm. I thought, how do I do this? Um, 
because I'm I'm not a I'm not a sort of TV celebrity archaeologist or anything like that. So I, I I'm not in a position to to sort of put it out there in, in that way. Um, so I just thought you know I could write a story. I need a topic. I, I can write a story about Stonehenge. Uh, what I need is 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 a plot. Sorry, it's not a topic. I need a plot. And uh, and one day I was I was talking to visitors about um, the Amesbury Archer, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a heck of a story there, you know. And I once taught a, a young archaeologist group about the Amesbury Archer burial, and we we did a whole three and a half hour session. We, we, we got people to make pots and we got people to make arrows and and then we we um we got one volunteer to lie down and, and everybody made a ritual and, and we, we we buried the person you know we, we literally laid all these things on him and, and said now imagine this once we put soil on top of it and everything else and, and what would be left and and that's what you're looking at and and it really worked brilliantly and um mm -hmm. And I thought I just made that story up. I could make up another story right. about the Avery Archer, and that's kind of what I've done. It's taken a few years, and foolishly I haven't brought it with me. I may have to disappear for ten seconds, and and go and fetch it. Um, that wouldn't be a bad I, idea. I have actually um, yeah, written a, a dirty, great, thick novel um, about the life of the Avery Archer and, and death of the Avery Archer. Uh, in and about Stonehenge, it's it's a it's a great saga of this one person's extraordinary life, um, and he must have had an extraordinary life because it, he's it's it's the richest um, early Bronze Age burial in Britain, mm -hmm. um, and and at the same time I, I was able to weave into the story all my ideas about um, Bronze Age and uh, religion i will go and fetch the book just so that i can flash it at you okay good Two thank keep you keep everybody happy william <laughs> i'll do a sang song and dance and i do apologize for the sound issues everybody i don't know what's going on we've got stormy weather where i am and that might be it but um i hope you've been enjoying the show it's this is meat and potatoes to me i love this this kind of thing so aha Right. Great. Yes. So, so well, where are we? The book. That's the book. There we are. Um, wonderful cover by uh, one of my colleagues at Stonehenge, who's a graphic artist. And I okay. said, "Would you like to do this? I can't promise to pay you anything, but if I earn any money, I'll do it." Um, so, yeah. at the moment, he's actually earned more out of it than I have. Um, oh. But it's, it, 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 by a couple of pounds. He's, he's still okay. slightly better off than me. Um, okay. But yeah, that's that's the book. It's it's uh, it's quite a solid novel, um, and it's as as close to what I see as the reality of, of of what life was like as I could make it. Okay. Um, in the seven months since I published it, and in the sort of year or so since I really finished writing it. Um, Archaeology has already moved on, and there's already one or two things in it which are, are probably um, suspect in archaeology already. And and I'm I'm quite sure in in ten years' time, people will look at reading this will say will laugh at, at some of the archaeological interpretation in it. Uh, they might also, I would like to think, um, look at it and say, "You got it right. You got mm -hmm. it spot on." I now know that that's how it worked. Um, only time's going to tell that, uh, but mm -hmm. it's a great yarn, it's a great story. Uh, everybody likes it, just nobody reads it. Um, <laughs> so, well, if you want, if, if you like, if you like to know about Stonehenge, and if you like a very, very different adventure story um, from the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, and a story about shamans and magicians and and and, um, and hunters. And, and it's, there's, there's bits of boys' own adventure in there, and there's bits of romance in there. Um, it's, it's an all-encompassing saga. Uh, Fantastic. And I've, 
and I've seen the Ames, Amesbury Archer. He's in Salisbury Museum. I, I, Salisbury, I mean, Salisbury Museum. Museum. Yes. And very well done. And I, I haven't been able to get the book yet, but I'm highly recommending it now. Uh, <laughs> in part because of this interview and all, all you've talked about. In part because I've read your blog articles. And I trust that it's a fantastic book. And let me see. Can you see? Is that your uh, the address for your blog? I tried to copy what you sent me. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. But there's there's the Facebook dot com stuff seems a bit um, unnecessary. Oh. But the the I have Tim um, blogspot dot blogspot. It's okay. the, the the address is is http s and then the colon and the two slashes um i of tim all one word dot blogspot um dot com it's it's basically a google blog okay but okay, I, this... I of tim rather than i the, the book is called the eye of time uh-huh there we are the eye of time and uh because i like silly jokes like that i i called the the blog spot the eye of tim it's okay. my views. Excellent. Um, and this, I think what I've just posted here has, um, I got it off the the blog page I had open and it. That's it. Great. Yep. Perfect. That's, so that's the, that's, that will take you straight to the, to the front page of the blog, basically. Okay. Perfect. And if it becomes possible to, um, uh sign up subscribe to the blog when we have that information i'll put it out too and um get okay. that out there yeah well let's say I, we talked about this earlier and i will um let you know when i find out how to do it uh, fantastic during uh, over the course of the next week <laughs> okay great well i really encourage people to look into this i mean whether you're a history buff or not um the the articles on the blog are so well written and you can tell by this interview what a great storyteller and conceptualizer <laughs> tim is i mean he knows his his stuff and um i think you'll enjoy reading his work i really do and it doesn't talk down to you but it's not quite where you need to have a phd in history to read it so, you know, it's it's approachable and not um, treating you like a child, like so many things out there do. So, thank you. Anyway, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, I've al I've always tried very hard not to sink in the jargon. Um, and, and, and I yeah. appreciate it. Do you have anything else you want to add before we end this? I don't think so. I mean, uh, once started, I can I can go on for hours. <laughs> but um, I I think we've we've basically covered the the the, the basics of, of um, the the shamanism and 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 the the centrality of Stonehenge. Stonehenge being the heart of the world or uh, right. the centre of the, the cosmos. Um, we've talked about which I didn't expect to. We've talked about. Um, Avebury and, and Stonehenge. That wasn't mm -hmm. uh, on my my plan at all, but uh, yeah, that was quite fun as well. Uh, okay, we've talked good. about me living in a haunted house. I, th I think we've covered all the bases that I thought of before <laughs> we, we started, so I'm happy. I, great. I am too then. And right. we, if you're willing to, I will definitely have you back on and we'll cover some more topics and hopefully have better internet connection. But um, I, did yeah. you have something you wanted to say? Oh, well. No, no. I was just thinking okay. about the internet connection. It was just sympathizing with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know so, what's wrong with it tonight. But... I don't know. I don't know either. But thank it's you, me, everybody. You know. <laughs> well, I usually blame me because I walk into a room and the computers go crazy. But um, thank you. And we'll see you next time all. Bye-bye. Here we go.